I'm John Spooner. Welcome. Just checking that the sound is on this time. Uh, I'm Director of Human Space Operations here at the Unlimited Space Agency. Welcome back to Answers HQ, The Space Shed. <laughs> Hopefully you are all enjoying this week's uh, mission, Astro Coding. We know that for some of you team leaders, the idea of having to learn another language, computer code, was a little bit intimidating to begin with. But we also know that now that you've started using the frankly brilliant resources that we've made for you. It's all all right, actually, isn't it? Yeah. Um, if you haven't started this week's mission yet, don't worry, plenty of time to be doing that. Uh, just head on over to astrosciencechallenge.com Com, where uh, you can find the resources for this week's mission and in fact for all of the missions if you go to the team leader resource page. Now in a few minutes I'm going to be joined by this week's expert guest Matt Cosby from Goonhilly Earth Station who's going to be answering all our questions about space coding but before then it is that time. He's my co-host, my best friend and Hipster software startup CEO in the making, Mini John. Hi, Mini John. How are you doing today? Right. Yeah. Okay. No. I I would say that it's best if we keep politics out of this show. Yeah. No. I agree. It's been enraging. And yes, the least that he could have done would be to apologise. But that is not why this lot are here. And I really would prefer if you didn't use that language, actually. I mean, yeah, he is. You, you, you can't really argue with that, can you? Uh, but moving on, not literally, because uh, certainly not to go on a 30 mile round trip drive to test our eyesight. Um, we've had some more mini Johns sent in of you, uh -huh. MJ. I know, right? Uh, let me bring these up. First up, we had this from Team Moonrock, uh, who have made, check this out. This is one of you in felt with a silver effect visor. It is cool, right? Apparently that mini John is now helping out with the next badge and may well have a trip or two to make. Only post lockdown though, right Team Moonrock? Oh, I mean, unless any of you are a special advisor to the Prime Minister of Great Britain, in which case you can just do whatever you like and you will be acting responsibly, legally and with integrity. I know, right? Uh, yeah, he is. Um, We've also been sent these brilliant Micro Johns, 3D printed Micro Johns. This is from uh, Agent, uh, Agent <laughs> Namagu. I know, it's a little worrying there. It looks like one of you is trying to escape through the table, MJ. Now, these are actually made by uh, uh, Sally's Science Stuff. Um, Sally's often in the chat here. I don't see her there today, but um, if she's got her own YouTube channel that she started since um, uh, lockdown happened. So after this show, you should head over to Sally's Science Stuff on this channel, uh, but only after this show. And uh, you could head over there instead of, say, heading on a day trip to Barnard Castle, because that would not be in the spirit of the lockdown that we're all adhering to in order to keep others safe and save lives. Because anyone that were to do that would be a... Exactly, Mini John. Uh, and this from uh, Cadets Caleb. I love this so much. Cadets Caleb and Cadet Isaac of Team Charlton have recreated their own entire space shed with a Lego Mini John. That's Lego Mini John on the left there. Plus, Mini John here has got a new friend. That's Mini Kev on the right there. Um, that is Mini John and Mini Kev in their space shed. You can check out. The, there's a full video, it's about two and a half minute video. It's on our Facebook. Um, 
after the show on Fridays, we have a chat on our Facebook uh, with team leaders or cadets, anyone that's over there. So if you check out that post from last Friday, you'll be able to see the whole video there. It is very funny. In fact, let's just check in on the chat here. Good morning, everybody there. We've got uh, Jim D, who says the Lego astronaut has... Oh, they've made a Lego astronaut and he's painted, but he's still drying. So they're going to send him in for Friday. Look forward to getting that. Uh, Paul uh, Mook, the sound is working. Thanks very much. I know that uh, you were here last week and uh, <laughs> we had some issues with the sound. Um, we've got a joke, which I will share with you later. I love uh, that Cadet Lucy, every broadcast. Let's do it now. Why did the seed... No, we'll save it for when Matt's on. I know that I know that he'll like that. Okay. Uh, oh, we've got a couple of birthday shout outs that we would like to do uh, just before we get to Matt, our special guest. First up, Cadet Sadie Sullivan in Belfast, who was eight on Sunday. Now, we know it's been a tough year for you, Sadie, with illness. So from all of us here at UNSA and all of your classmates at Cave Hill Primary in Belfast, happy birthday. Uh, also on Sunday, it was Cadet Maria's 10th birthday. Maria's in Batley. We love getting your questions, Maria. Um, so please keep sending them in. Keep practicing the goalkeeping, looking awesome with your new gloves that you sent us a picture of there. Happy 10th birthday to you. And Sunday was a big day for birthdays because it was also answers space mom sarah's birthday happy birthday sarah that is uh, our space mom sarah there she particularly loves this photo of her this is when we're out live in the actual space shed we go out into festivals and uh, sarah always looks after me on my uh, astronaut delivery vehicle which you can see in the background there um, if you're enjoying the astro science challenge in any way is in no small part down to the brilliance the care the dedication of everyone at answer but particularly sarah in the last few weeks so happy birthday from all of us here we hope you enjoyed some nice time off at the weekend which i know that you spent all of at home which means that unlike the pm special advisor who is a you are rather a good and a decent human being who respects both the spirit as well as the rules of lockdown. It doesn't look for technical loopholes that excuse your selfish behavior because you think you're better than the rest of us. Uh, Yes, he is. So uh, that is enough of that. Let us get today's guest in, MJ. Okay, cadets, agents, all underground crew, would you please just stop with all the politics? Would you perform your final safety checks and give a massive space shed welcome to Chief Technology Officer at Goon Hilly Earth Station? Would you please give it up for Matt Cosby? Good morning. Good, Good morning, morning, John. Morning, morning Mini John. How are you? Hi. Mini John says hello. Hello. Oh, he's loving you? your backdrop there, which we can talk a little bit about in a moment, actually. But you're looking very good there, Matthew. Thank you. Well, it's a very sunny day in Cornwall. <laughs> as it always is. As it always is. Are you actually in Cornwall? Uh, no, I'm. I'm sitting in front of a green screen, so unfortunately, no, I'm not. This was. Uh, this was yesterday from a picture from our control centre, which I'm using as a backdrop. OK, let's talk. So we, a lot of our team are working from home. Uh, only essential staff are working on the site to keep the satellites operating. Of course they are. No unnecessary travel required on your part. Um, so uh, you work at, you are the chief technology officer. You've got a really cool title. Chief technology officer at Goonhilly Earth Station, which is probably the coolest named Earth Station anywhere. But um, we should probably just clarify, Matt, what is Goonhilly Earth Station. Okay, so Goonhilly Earth Station was originally set up, well, uh, during the wars for a radar station, but then it was changed into a telecom station for 1962 when it was used for Telstar for the first transatlantic TV pictures. It was then used for Apollo, so it distributed the Apollo pictures around the world, around Europe. So it was received from Goonhilly, then transmitted to London, then London distributed it. We've also been used for Live Aid and a lot of the Olympics. Uh, and now it's owned by a small company. And we, we bought it about uh, in, in 2009, 2014. Sorry. And uh, we're now converting it to, to operate s satellites for companies who distribute their, your TV, but also deep space communications. And that's what that antenna there is for. We were, we're currently modifying that antenna, 32 meter aperture for lunar missions, but also deep space missions. So basically, deep space is anything 200, 2 million kilometers away. <laughs> you can communicate with stuff 2 million kilometers away. 
and beyond yes that's yeah yeah absolutely. that's pretty cool we will, we'll, when this is finished when that's finished um because you how many dishes have do we call them dishes or antennae so we call them it's an antenna or tenors Antennae are little things of, uh, for insects. So I knew that. I knew that. Call them. Some people call them aerials, but I like, to, or some people call them dishes. That's fine. I, I refer to that one as the dish, but the uh, antenna or aerial, uh, the, when it was owned by BT, they used to give them Arthurian legend names. So actually we've got Arthur's out of shot, which was the first one used for Telstar and Apollo. And this one is called Merlin. That's a cool, I mean, if you're going to name a telescope, Merlin is a good name because we've got, um, yeah. uh, we've been amused in the past because t telescopes have pretty rubbish names, right? There is one called the Very Large Telescope. Yeah. And then there's one yeah, called yeah. the Extremely Large Telescope. Yes, but in fairness, it is quite large and extremely large. Yeah, but yeah. Merlin is a better name. Merlin is good. And actually, out of shot, just here is um, Guinevere. That's so cool. Um, so you're the chief technology officer at Goon Hilly right now. Uh, we know that Goon Hilly is uh, communicating uh, with space. What do you do? What's your job as chief technology officer? So I'm responsible for the, the technology of, that Goon Hilly gets involved with. So I, I don't get into the nitty gritty, but what I do do is work on Goon Hilly 6, which is the one at the back. So although I'm the technical authority, so I have to sign off all the designs for Goonly 6, but I'm also doing a bit of the coding, helping out the certain bits of the, the, the code to, on Goonly 6 to ensure that it, it is suitable for operations with ESA spacecraft as well as NASA spacecraft. So that's some, that's some major responsibility that you've got there, frankly. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, in fact, we've got, I've got a couple of questions that come in from architects about the work that you're doing there. Um, so uh, we're going to come, someone wants to know what your favorite, let's get this one out of the way. What's your favorite biscuit, Matt? I'm going to start with the important stuff because okay, we're going to talk about biscuits later. I'm, I'm going to be controversial then because I'm going to go with Jaffa cake. Now we're going to have a dis debate about whether that's a biscuit or not. I'm sorry, I've started it off. Yeah. So it's Jaffa cake. We well, see, this, it's all going to pop off in the chat, I'm sure now. You can't have a Jaffa cake. It's not a biscuit. <laughs> Uh, okay, if we're not, if we're not, no, I, have, uh, if, if, I'm not saying. I know I'm standing by my principles. Jaffa yeah, cake. you if, Jaffa cakes your biscuit of choice. Jaffa cakes your biscuit of choice. Um, the, <laughs> I was distracted by that. The question I was actually looking for was someone was wanting to know: Has any of the code? Ever, oh, it's uh, this is Cadet Scarlet would like to ask: Has the coding ever right. been wrong and affected anything important? Well, actually, yes, there's lots of times where code has been wrong and affected things. Well, actually, one of the examples, and uh, it's Ariane 5, the very first launch of Ariane 5, had a software fault where it was using uh, reusing old software, uh, and it caused the, the, the rocket to veer off course and had to be destroyed. There are a few things where software has caused problems, but we do go, go through a huge amount of testing to ensure that the software doesn't cause these problems. And one of the differences between space software and that sort of designed using the same processes and built using the same processes, but that sort of tested a bit more rigorously for space flight because mainly because you can't go and fix it. Uh, if something goes wrong and actually now we've got the coding <coughs> does actually um, it does get changed periodically but we don't want it to do something unexpected and so every single line of code is tested to make sure it doesn't do anything that it's not supposed to do so not often is the answer not, but, no, but there's always room for things happen and yeah you, but there are procedures to get around it and, and people can operate spacecraft to try and work out things around it and fix things so it is different. Coding for space is different for coding for Earth-based applications. It is, but the principles are the same. So if you can code in on the ground, you can code in space. So I've coded, I have code on on Mars, I have code on around Mars, and they are they're actually using the very first one, which was Beagle, which was using an assembler language, which is actually really well. Let's tight. let's hold this because you mentioned Beagle in a very offhand way there, Matt. But um, there might be some of our cadets that haven't heard of Beagle. Uh, maybe you could tell us what's, what's Beagle, Matt. Okay, well, Beagle was a planetary Mars planetary probe uh, in early two thousand, so two thousand, 
It went along with Mars Express. It was actually well well before its time because it was a sort of a new space idea of we've got or we've got 60 kilos spare mass. What can we do? And uh, Professor Colin Pullinger from Open University in Milton Keynes proposed a beagle, a lander, a small lander that would land on Mars that would be taken by by Mars Express. And it was sort of a, a British uh, endeavour, and it involved quite a lot of people on, in the British space programme to develop the, the lander. And we had a very, very short period of time to do it. And we, uh, when I was involved, I was about 26 at the time, uh, with my friend uh, Steve, we, we basically built the, uh, the communication system for it. So it would then communicate to both the the host spacecraft that took it to Mars, but also the NASA spacecraft that was around Mars, obviously. So we were given this task of trying to build this unit in six months to test it to, with uh, Odyssey before it was launched to Mars. So we did all the work, we worked every day. The only concession is that we didn't work, we started at 10 o'clock on a Sunday as opposed to nine o'clock. And then we got there and we were about to, we packed all the kit into the taxi, ready to go to Heathrow to go to the Cape where it was ready to launch and we got in through saying that actually we haven't got clearances to get on the Cape so we, we had to just unpack and we had to do the testing later in JPL. JPL which is the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena in California. Yeah. Space stuff has such cool names JPL um, the Jet Propulsion JPL, Laboratory. Yeah. Um, so you have code in space and on this very famous to a lot of people mission which has inspired a lot of people so I know that um, you've also uh, You've got other code that is going to Mars on the ExoMars mission, right? Because we've, uh, on some of our podcasts, uh, live from the space shed, search it up on whatever platform you like your podcasts, uh, we got an, uh, an interview with Abby Hutty, who I guess you must have worked with at some stage, who was the lead engineer for the rover part of that. But you've got code on that mission as well, right? Yeah, so I was the, the, the design authority and system engineer for the ExoMars UHF transceiver. So there was a... A derivation of the Beagle system, and then that was actually used for the EDM lander, Scaparelli lander in 2016. The electronic and, dance music lander. No, I mean uh, I would I would go on that it's, mission. It's called the Entry Descent Module, so not as exciting. But the the, the official title is Scaparelli, named after the Italian scientist. So that was that was there uh, on the 2016 meet. Uh, mission and it was taken by uh, the TGO Trace Gas Orbiter mission, and that was then dropped off, and then it hurtled through the atmosphere and it was actually transmitting data back as it was going in through the atmosphere, and that the, the data was then being transmitted using our unit, but unfortunately it did have a glitch and it not our bit the the main computer had a glitch and I think it uh, it crashed before it could deploy properly. Well, so. Because Beagle, famously as well, um, we should say that while Beagle did make it to Mars, um, we've never had any data come back from it, right? No, unfortunately not. The, the, the solar panels were actually folded on, and so you had to unfurl all the solar panels before the antenna could be revealed, which was unfortunate. But because of the mass constraints, I mean, 60 kilos is not, is not a lot. So it's actually that was the only design we could come up with. But actually, the 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 legacy of Beagle is that you've now got to transmit all the way down. So part of the entry and descent landing phase, you've got to transmit, and so all the spacecraft around Mars watch you as you go down. Also, radio telescopes on the Earth also watch you to make sure that you're. So if something does go wrong, you can then work out what went wrong. And actually, because we were transmitting all the way down from the EDM, from Scaparelli, we could then work out, or ESA could work out what went wrong, and so therefore correct it for the ExoMars rover. But we should say, because it sounds like I know that a lot of people have been very down on Beagle, going, oh, there was this... I adore that whole mission, and I know uh, the Pillingers a little bit. Um, Shu, who was Colin and Judith's uh, daughter, lived very close to me for a while, and then I met uh, Judith, and uh, we've done stuff with them. Um, but basically, building a spaceship in their garden shed—I mean, it was a it was a barn, right? But 
uh, on a farm. But even so, this extraordinary technical achievement um, that involved artists as well. So we had Damien Hurst uh, yeah. working on it, a visual artist, and Blur the Band did the call sign for it. Um, huge creativity on the part of people like yourself as well having to program this stuff and solve the problems, like you say, of the mass, the amount of uh, weight that you were allowed to... But it's hard to get to Mars, right? There's like a... What's the percentage chance of a successful mission for anyone getting to Mars? Well, it's it's very low, I think. Um, the Americans are much more successful in landing than anybody else. But, hope, well, we, we will definitely land, be landing with the ExoMars with Robert Franklin Rover in two years' time. Definitely. But, but I, I remember think the, with Spiegel talking about mass, we, we, I remember having a four hour discussion and a meeting about 25 grams, so the, 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 the mass of a bag of crisps that we were trying to get 25 grams. And we didn't in the end, and we had to just shave it off something else. So it's. That, not literally that, shave it off with like a plane. This is how I imagine the build going <laughs> Colin in a shed. Um, it's an extraordinary mission. The fact that it arrived there is a huge accomplishment. Uh, and there's, uh, it's, it's sad that nothing came back because of that tiny detail of the solar panels not opening. We have a question from Team Leader 42. If a future Mars mission was to find Beagle 2, would they be able to start up the Earth communications after all these years, you think, if they could maybe fix that solar panel and move it out of the way? Is that something that could happen? So we've had we've had chats about whether if you opened up the final thing would it would it start communicating uh, there aren't that many life limiting components the you probably just need to dust take away some of the dust of the solar panels but yeah why not i think you could i would love that we would finally get that message uh from it um We've also got a question here this is related to you were talking a little while uh, a little while back about um that you could communicate at least two million kilometers deep into space using the dishes that are behind you there when it's up and running um if agent annabelle would like to know do those radio waves do they get weaker the further they travel in space and if so how will we communicate with places like mars so if you can they they get further apart so if you have a and hello about hello annabelle if you have um a torch if you get it closer, you'll, the, the torch beam on the wall is smaller. But if you pull it apart, then the beam gets wider, but it also gets dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. And that's similar to the, the dishes, that you, the further away the, the beam is dispersed. And so your energy is then dis being dispersed. So you need larger apertures, which is why you need the large dish here to collect that energy. So the energy is still going, but it's just going in further and diverging. Good question. So how do we communicate? I mean, is there a way of how do we go those further distances? Well, is you it... just have to collect. You just have to have more and more a bigger aperture to collect the, the, the energy. So just massive dishes. Yes. So we <laughs> the the uh, the dish behind me. So here I'm trying not to wave my arms because it will give away the, the effects that I'm not really there. <laughs> Kill the magic. This dish here, if you it, if it was a torch, it will illuminate about a quarter of the moon. So you'd have you could move a spotlight around the moon of so a quarter of its disk but but with mars it illuminates the, its entire planet and the orbits around it so it, because it's so it's further away. and beyond the technical so and beyond the technical build of these uh, huge pieces of amazing engineering uh, they're controlled using the code that you write right um yes. Wondering what, what languages, because there's lots of different, like human languages, lots of different languages, right? You've got lots of different computer languages. What are the languages that you're using mostly to space code? So just to clear, it's a team of people working on the code, and I'm just a part of the team. It's not just me. But I, So yesterday I was simulating something for, for from Mars, and I was writing that in C. A lot of the test code is written in Python. And we also use scripting languages to control our modem. So we use different types. Uh, in fact, Perl was used. But what we try and do is try and, to, try and have one or two and not have multiple ones. Because 
if, if you then try to maintain the software, it's easier if it's the same language. And this is and Python is a very is an increasingly common language and a very popular language uh, that's being used on Earth, certainly. And it's the one that uh, uh, lots of people are being taught in schools right now, right? Yes. Is that would you... If you learn the syntax of Python, then you can get you can learn C, and C is is very popular and and, and is used. Uh, in control systems and, and actually the Mars Express, sorry, the ExaMars transceiver is using C code. So if you were um, recommending to people, if you're going to start with a language, a computer, a computer coding language, start with Python? Yeah, start with Python. Start with Python, buy yourself a, a small Raspberry Pi, because we've got the Raspberry Pis on board Space Station, the Astro Pis that uh, were launched a few days before Tim Peake was launched uh, and was using coding uh, coding uh, examples and tutorials there uh, and it's a it's a great little small computer that's inexpensive and, and you can code and you can also the one thing that I think about coding is, is great is that if you code it and it, you make it do something like you make it move uh, a pump or make it move a lever or turn a light on an LED on and getting your code to control something and then then that's just what a satellite is a satellite is just a bunch of electronics that's being controlled by software and electronics. So it's just a box of software in the same way that your mobile phone is a box of software. So you, if you want to get into the space industry, learning to code is a great way of doing it. How did, we've got a question here from Lego Astronaut on the chat who would like to know, Matt, how did you get into coding? So now you're working as a space coder, you've got code on Mars and you're sending messages out into deep, deep space, but where did it start for you? Well, what, you, so this is actually great for this day because we're launching, or the America are launching the Crew Dragon uh, today. Uh, SDS-1, which was the very first shuttle launch, uh, when I was at primary school, I was six years old, the, the, the teacher wheeled in the TV, the school TV. In those days, it, you only had one TV in school and it was a box. They opened the door and we watched during our lunch hour, we watched SDS-1, which was the first shuttle launch, launch. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. But then I thought, well, it's not, I can't do it in space because these are Americans, I only do space. And that's what I thought for a long time. And then I went to university. And that's my parents said, look, go to, go to university, get a degree, and then you've got something to fall back on if you, if you can't do what, what um, you want to do. Uh, and I took it with space because I was interested in space science at Leicester University. Um, and then I applied just the one space job and I got it working for a company in in Farnborough in Hampshire. So as we're hearing from a lot of people that work in the industry it's like follow your passion uh, and do the things that you enjoy doing. Sure. What was it that because um, we're about the same age, uh, sadly for you, um, <laughs> because I remember watching those space shuttle missions as well on STS-1 that first space shuttle mission and be, that being the thing that really got me into space. Um, but what was it I, at the time, I had a computer called like a, I had a uh, a Dragon Thirty Two computer, and that oh, yeah. was what I started uh, coding on. And I used to get magazines, and on the back of the magazine, there would be a page where it go copy out this bit of code into your Dragon Thirty Two, yeah. and uh, it will make a little game. Um, and that was what sort of got me into an interest in coding. What was it for you about actual coding? Well, we had um, at school we had again it was one school computer, and I, th I think it was a Lynx. And I can't, I had a Lynx computer, and it was connected to a little robot on a ribbon cable. And you could program it, and I, never, I don't recall which language it was, to go move around a maze. And it was just amazing that you could program something that then would, would compile onto this box this, with this wheels, with, the, with wires coming off it. And it would drive around a maze, and you could get it to drive around a maze. I mean, that was, that was pretty amazing. But the, the, the software, I wanted to work on space, on, on satellites when I was at um, at my the job and it was an opportunity to the only thing that was available was was the to code so I, I just learned I would ask well can you send me on a course and they did and I learned how to code there professionally and then worked on a on a on a mission there and then that got me into Beagle and now and then Beagle basically I wouldn't be talking to you now if it wasn't for Beagle so Beagle is, as I I always claim that Beagle is the success that uh, the reason why I'm here. Uh, we have a lot of people that say that. And again, just mentioning Abby Hutty, uh, who worked on the Rosalind Franklin rover that's going next year, we hope, um, claims that she says that when she was a kid, uh, she wanted to own a teddy bear factory. 
or she wanted to run a teddy bear factory until she saw Beagle. And it was only when she heard about Beagle in the news that she understood there was a space industry in the UK that she could be part of. Um, uh, yeah, that, I, I did realise the, the public interest in Beagle, because you're embedded in it, you didn't realise that there was this massive public engagement with Beagle. But when we were trying to, after it had landed, so the Christmas day, we had landed and after a few days afterwards we were in the control center in Leicester and it was actually a control center in the National Space Center where the the, the public could go in but we were screened it was glass screen so they could see in so we were there busily trying to want trying to could concoct commands to send to see if we could then try and see if we can communicate to it and, and then all the time people were just staring at us so there, at that point I realized that actually Beagle was actually people were actually taking an interest in acting willing us to, to find it right. if you don't know about beagle search it up it's an incredible story uh made by basically you're all friends geeky friends sending a spaceship uh to mars and it got there not many people can say that um i believe it's in the science museum as well so you can go and see it in the science museum in london um cadets darcy and Maisie would like to know what in your work are you most proud of? We've talked a lot about Beagle, but is that are there other things or is there? Yeah, a Beagle, just there with Mars Express watching the ED, um, the, the Mars, sorry, the Curiosity rover go down. I was sitting in the control center waiting for that to be transmitted back. So that was great in, in, in Eastock in Germany. What was that like? That's Seriously, that's sitting, in, sitting in mission control? Because yeah. I love the idea of mission control watching the spaceship that you have a part of you in what, what, what yeah, can you describe quite, the feeling it's surreal to be honest you're in this sort of complete sort of bubble and and it's actually becomes normal so you 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 don't realize because it's your job that you're um that you're actually physically controlling something or receiving something from mars and you just have and when you talk to people they just go oh, i don't believe you and then you sort of get grounded and say well okay this quite this is quite good but just watching uh, the the very first moment I worked in, in ninety seven on STS eighty one had an experiment well, I, I didn't I worked on as a team I was a very junior engineer on a team that had a, a mission on space shuttle that went to Mir and the space shuttle when it docked on Mir but it stayed on the shuttle but uh, I was there for when it landed uh, and the noise that the shuttle made as it came broke the speed barrier and the, it just had this massive bump through. The, through your body that i will remember forever and before that sts 82 was on the launch pad and be because the space shuttle was delayed by a few hours we, we got to go and stand on the launch pad of with the shuttle so i've, I've managed to stand between the the, the the orbiter and the main tank on the launch pad and stand between the two. Oh my word that is amazing and i, I hate heights so, so i was jealous <laughs> I mean, that's cool. So uh, if anyone fancies maybe having those sorts of experiences, learn computer code <laughs> and get into space. This is it sounds like it's quite straightforward, Matt. Oh, it's, it's not as difficult as it's made out. So people think, oh, space is complicated. It is complicated, but it's not unobtainable. So I'm not an A star student. I got B's. I I was just coded, I got the right job, and, and then I worked my way through um, by learning to code and then getting these jobs. These jobs are out there in the UK. These jobs you can do. We are crying out for software people. And so actually it is very easy if you've got a software background, a coding background, or, or just learning to code on your Raspberry Pi or on your computer to be able to get into the space industry because you need coders, whether it's for the ground-based analytics at ground-based applications or the spacecraft itself or the dishes that control the spacecraft it all requires code it's a great and way. this it's is more electronic and this is something that you can start at any age right there's absolutely um you would this is something you can start training towards at five you know as soon as you can read and write right start coding yeah. um would you like to hear yeah. uh cadet lucy's joke for this week Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, cool. uh, why did the seed want to go into space? I have no idea. Why did the seed want to go into space? So it could shoot up. Oh. Ah. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> mini john mini john likes that one um Excellent. matt we've talked uh gonna let you go in a moment um and uh we'll deal with the fallout of you uh claiming a jaffa cake, jaffa cake. as your favorite biscuit um what are you working on at the moment what are the projects that are happening right now and or in the future that you're really excited about well with this antenna here that's keeping me awake at night we're trying to get the code and get the the pointing everything calibrated so we can support ESA missions at the end of the year or early next year and i just want to be able to point that thing at mars and receive the, the spacecraft from from mars and then distribute it to to esa and nasa and jaxa and then there's uae as well launching this year uh, there's a lot of people going to mars and there's going to be a lot of people wanting to use large antennas to receive their data from mars so we just need to get that up and running and then show that we can use it and be, be part of of the ESA network and that would be amazing super cool um one final thing before we go because we mentioned about uh you, you said about the raspberry pi uh, astro anya on the chat says hi and wonders hi. what would be what would you recommend as a good raspberry pi kit or project to start with well the the cheapest one is the i believe it's the pi zero so that's very cheap and it's got little uh, wires on it so you can solder wires onto it to control leds and so on and so i think if you just have that with a with a very simple led and a resistor uh, solder it together if you can then uh, just write some code to just to turn on the led and then you can just expand onto that there are other kits for robots as well driving around robots that you can do that but simple simple things for that so what i have um a little raspberry pi outside watering my greenhouse. So it has a little pump, it has a timer, and it just the greenhouse. That is really cool. What a great project during lockdown and during this currently hot early summer. Uh, build a robot yeah. that waters your greenhouse. <laughs> Um, you can also, uh, I'll ask uh, Javeria, who's our missions communications officer, who is moderating the chat, who's over there. Um, if I don't know where it is on your screen. On my screens, it's over there. I have got it. I haven't got it anyway, on my screen. But, um, <laughs> I'm going to ask Javeria if maybe you could find a link, uh, send it to Raspberry Pi, but also to the Astro Pi project that you referenced earlier, because you can program, you can uh, submit your code that you make, and it could end up on the space station, right? It could, yeah. yeah. Um, so do that. That's a great project. That's one I would recommend to us. Um, Matthew, thank you. So, oh, also, yeah, we're both going to be watching tonight. Uh, I know that I'm going to be doing it with my children. You're going to be doing it with yours. Um, yeah. If uh, Javeria, you could also find uh, the link for um, on the NASA, or you can look it up on the NASA website. There is going to be a really cool program because SpaceX are going to be launching this first crewed mission uh, to Mars. It's happening about nine thirty British summertime tonight. So it's persuade your parents for you to stay up you know there's no school tomorrow it's half term um and uh watch this launch because it's a historic moment and i think the coverage is going to be very very cool i believe so so watch absolutely watch the launch because it's going to the space station i think once you've launched once it's launched 20 minutes later it will fly over the uk so you could actually come see it outside so i think i can't remember which way around it goes but i think but you'll see the space station and the crew dragon. So you might be able to, if the clouds are free of clouds, the sky's free of clouds, you might be able to see both of them. So tonight you can see two spaceships. If the cloud, let's, let's hope for clear skies tonight. That would be super cool. Yeah, that would be great. That would be super. Um, two human space, spacecraft going over at the same time, one chasing it. <laughs> it really is. Uh, Matt, how do we keep in touch with you? What's, is, uh, is Twitter the best way if people wanted to ask? If you had any more questions for Matt, is Twitter a good place to ask? Yes, that's fine. But you can also go to our website at gunhealy.org uh, and we, we can, we can have got a little web uh, email there you can send stuff to. But yeah, Twitter's fine. That's fine. Um, well, if they send, it, if they send, um, if they send questions to you, then you can forward it on. That's no problem. Absolutely. What's your Twitter handle? Uh, at... Matt Cosby. Nice and easy. At Matt Cosby. Yeah, that is how you spell Matt's name on screen right now. At Matt Cosby. Matt, thank you so much for your time today. I know you are extraordinarily busy. You were in meetings before uh, we, we came on here. Um, I know that they go into the evening as well. Thank you for all the work that you're doing. Uh, really thank massive thanks for answering all the questions from our cadets today. Would you all please give it up for Matt Cosby? <laughs>
Oh, how cool was that, MJ? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I am really excited about watching that launch tonight. Um, on Friday, uh, on Friday's show, we don't have a human as a guest. <laughs> no, not an alien. Uh, on Friday's show, we are celebrating Unser's favourite snack, the biscuit. <laughs> Exactly, MJ. Now, all of the answer team are going to be reviewing a biscuit, uh, just whatever biscuits they've got in their house uh, during lockdown. And then the top three biscuits are going to go through to a grand finale biscuit off on Twitter where you can all vote for what should be the best biscuit. It's entirely subjective. <laughs> Uh, and we're looking forward to some of the arguments. I mean, conversations around what should be named Unser's Best Biscuit. Um, in fact, if you would like to share your reviews, your own biscuit reviews, we would love to receive them. You can send them in for us. All you have to do is choose a biscuit, whatever you've got in the house, and then review it on these four following criteria. Number one, looks. Is it characteristic of the biscuit it is supposed to be? Now, we are all about innovation and thinking outside of the box at answer, but with regard to biscuits, if it's calling itself a ginger snap, it should look like a ginger snap, okay? Um, so number one, looks. Number two, snap. Does it have an appropriate snap for the type of biscuit that it is? Number three, dunkability. It needs to hold well when dunked in a cup of tea for at least three seconds. And number four, deliciousness just all round deliciousness and then you give it a score out of 10 so we're on looks snap dunkability deliciousness score out of 10 and because we want to include as many of your reviews as possible uh we're going to ask we're not going to we're only going to consider reviews that are shorter than 60 seconds so everything under a minute the snappier the shorter the better um and if you would like to hear an example of a biscuit review, so this actually comes from our friend Maddie Moat, uh, who does biscuit reviews on her Instagram sometimes. She hasn't done one for a while, actually. Maddie, if you're watching, give us a new biscuit review, please. But um, we asked her to do a biscuit review on our podcast last summer when we were out in the actual world, in the actual space shed. Uh, so if you search up on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, or wherever it is you get your podcasts, live from the Space Shed. There's an interview there with Maddie Moe, and about halfway through, uh, she reviews a Grandma Wilde's Ginger Biscuit, I believe, is the biscuit that she reviews, <laughs> as an example. Um, so, yeah, thank you again to Matt and to all of you for joining us. Please do keep sending us your work. We love to see it. Send us your versions of Mini John uh, for us to see. We'll show them. We're going to do a massive bumper gallery of all of your work on uh, Friday. We're at Unspace Agency on all of the socials, Twitter, Instagram, forward slash Unspace Agency on Facebook, or you can email us hello at unspaceagency.earth and send us your biscuit, your biscuit reviews as well. So stay safe, look after each other and see you again for more live from the Space Shed soon. I'm living in, 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 I'm living